Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone? Joni Mitchell first sang those words in 1970. Counting Crows redid that song in 2002. But the truth in that hasn't changed since it was first sung that so often in our lives we don't recognize what we have until it's too late. That we take for granted so many things in our lives. I can say for me, I do that all the time. You know, when I leave here today, I'm going to walk into the parking lot and I'm going to get into my car. And I'm going to drive to Costco because that's what I do every Sunday after church. <laughs> Actually, they all know me by name because I do it three or four times a week. But I'll buy some groceries and I'll go home, open up a refrigerator that already has groceries in it and add to it. I'll maybe flop down on my couch for a little bit and turn on a TV that has 140 channels and I have the starter package. I'll flip through and probably not find anything worth watching. Tonight I'll go to sleep in a warm, comfortable memory foam bed. I'll wake up in the morning and I'll get in the shower and probably take a long one because the hot water is going to feel so nice. Get in my car where I can go pretty much anywhere I want. I'm going to come here because this is where I want to be. And if I'm running out of gas, I pull into a gas station. I stick a little piece of plastic in a machine and it allows me to refill my tank. There's a lot of things in that little scenario that I could be thankful for. There's a lot of things in there that I don't really recognize on a daily basis, but I might if they were gone. I've spent most of my life in California, but I spent the first eight years of my life in Michigan. I recall very clearly in Michigan, I grew up in East Lansing, Michigan, I recall very clearly some winters where there were storms, some summers where there were some storms, and this horrible sound that would go throughout the city. It was the, the sirens that would tell us we better get to cover. As a kid, at five, six, seven years old, when I heard that sound, I knew what to do. Get home fast. Well, here, we don't really know much about that. I know many of you are from other parts of the country and have seen it, but, but here, we don't have that so much. In Michigan, there would be days we couldn't leave the house. There would be days upon days where the power would be out. Luckily, it was cold enough to keep all of our groceries frozen. 
But here, the power going out, we get a little rolling brownage and we freak out. Do the lights just flicker? What are we going to do? But I do remember sometimes, and one in particular in the late 1980s, when the power was out in spots around here for an extended amount of time. And I bring this up because I'm thinking of going to a gas station and sticking a credit card in and getting gas, something I do all the time. But I remember then how hard that was. See, the power was out in most places, and so gas stations that had gas couldn't pump it. The few gas stations that had power, well, they ran out of gas rather quickly. There was one gas station, though. I was living in Pacific Grove, and it was on the, the corner of Asilomar and 17 Mile Drive, actually where it's sunset, turns into Asilomar. The gas prices had more than doubled because, well, there was high demand. And the line went from that corner nearly down to Asilomar Beach. People were frustrated and angry, yet willing to wait in this line to get gas. Something that they wouldn't be expecting on a normal day, but that they didn't know what they had until it was gone. Today we're going to talk about gratitude. We're going to talk about thanksgiving. We're going to talk about appreciation and the importance of that in our lives. So we don't have to wait until it's too late to recognize what we have. You may notice in your bulletins that there's four blank lines. Instead of telling you what the fill-ins, I thought I would do a choose-your-own-adventure today. But you can decide what you want the four main points to be. And maybe afterward you can compare them to one another. As we look at the Bible, there are thanks and gratitude and appreciation directed and exemplified throughout. But there's one verse in particular that I, that I wanted to touch on, and that's 1 Thessalonians 5.18. It couldn't be more direct. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We're going through a series now called Psalm Mixtape, where we're looking at the Psalms and we're, we're trying to, to see what God wants to say through them. I knew I wanted to talk about thankfulness. I, that's something that I've been working on for, for some time now. Developing a, a heart of gratitude is something that, that God's been doing in me for some time. And so I knew that's what I wanted to share with you. So I started reading through the Psalms. And I found a lot of them that, that talked about what had, God had done. There were a lot of them that had thanks. But I ended up on Psalm 103, which interestingly enough, doesn't even have the word thanks in it. But nonetheless, God was speaking to me through this. Psalm 103, verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits. As I was thinking about and praying about thankfulness and reading through Psalms, I got as far as Psalm 103 verse 2. And it just struck me that David said, forget not all his benefits. God was speaking to me right there. That that's one of the things that I had not been doing in my thankfulness. That I hadn't been focusing on looking at God and all of his benefits. But the truth is that if we forget God's benefits, which is God's blessings, it's what God has done for us and for others. If we get into that place where we forget about those things. Then we're in danger of ending up like the woman who went to the store the day before Thanksgiving 
and was disgusted and dismayed and angry and frustrated at the small size of the turkeys that were left for purchase. She went up to the person behind the counter and she said, Hey, don't these turkeys get any bigger? And the man behind the counter said, No, they're dead. <laughs> this woman probably had access to more food than many people in this world would have in a week or a month. Yet, she was angry and she was frustrated, hypothetically, in the size of what she saw. That what she saw wasn't good enough and what she saw wasn't big enough. If we don't get in the habit of thanking God for what we do have, we're in danger of being ungrateful for what we don't have. If we don't get in the habit of thanking God for what we do have, we're in danger of being ungrateful for what we don't have. And Psalm 103 tells us to begin thankfulness now. It says, get into the habit of not forgetting what God has done. Get into the habit of not forgetting what God has given us. Get in the habit of not forgetting God's blessings. So what are those blessings? What kind of things has God given you? Take a moment. Reflect on that. I came up with a few. My job. My health my home, my possessions, my family, my friends. The truth is I could keep on going, but the slide ran out of room. So I stopped at those six. There's so many blessings in our lives if we truly stop and reflect. Well, then I went back to Psalm 103 and I started reading through it some more. And I didn't find a single time that David showed gratitude for the things that I had just listed. I don't see a time where he showed gratitude or thankfulness or praised God for anything that was tangible. No possessions, no relationships, no health, no wealth. None of that. He picked different things to recognize from God. He said, praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then he starts to list them. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. I don't think that that is where I go when I stop to recognize what God has done. Yet I think that that's maybe where we should start. David didn't praise God or thank God or express gratitude for the things that I listed. He praises God because God forgives. He, he praises God because God heals and he praises God because God redeems. He recognizes that God is loving. He recognizes that God is compassionate and merciful and patient and just. David isn't thanking God for the things I typically do. He's thanking him or something deeper. So it got me thinking, why, why those things? Why this? One thought that I had was that David can't lose those things. David can't earn those things. And the world can't take these things away. 
So it got me thinking that if I can't get satisfaction with these things, I can't get no satisfaction. There was a band uh, a few years ago who thought the same thing, and they did a song about it. And they said, I can't get no satisfaction. The reality is, if we can't get satisfaction with those deeper, fundamental, foundational things, we're never going to be satisfied with the other stuff in this world. It's just simply not going to make it happen. I'm reminded of the Sermon on the Mount, where, where Jesus is talking, and I'm thinking about the things that are important to those who know Jesus. And in Matthew 6, 19 through 20, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus was talking about a depth to where we put value. Now most often when we hear this passage, we're talking about our financial resources. That seems to be what we're saying is invest your finances in those things that are enduring, who have eternal um, implications. And so it's a little bit different than what David was saying. But really the whole idea is that where we find value is in those things of, of heavenly influence. And those things that, that come from God and that give back into his kingdom. David is telling us in Psalm 103 that the things that are important to him are his treasures laid up in heaven, are those things that come directly from God. And he says that the greatest treasure is that God loves him and gives compassion to him. Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. God's compassion is an amazing thing. He says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. But then he continues, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. See, God knows how we are formed because he formed us. God knows how we are created because he created us. He created us differently than the rest of his creation. We read in the Genesis creation account that when he created man, he said, it is very good. He looked upon man differently than the rest of creation. He has a special love and a special connection with human beings. That we have a special place when it comes to God. That's a big deal. He loves us in a different way than he loves everything else. And he demonstrates this love in many profound ways. But one I want to spend some time on is found in verse 103, verse 4. And it says, he redeems your life from the pit. He redeems your life from the pit. And as we look at forgetting not his benefits, I want to look at the pit. As we read through the Bible, we find lots of stories about people who found themselves in pits. Jeremiah was thrown into a well, a literal pit, and sunk down into the mud. Daniel was thrown into a pit that we know of as the lion's den. Joseph was thrown into a pit by his brothers as they were scheming to kill him until they changed his mind and changed their mind and sold him into slavery. These were real live pits, holes in the ground that people found themselves in. 
And in each of those situations, God reached into those pits. And he pulled them out. And he set them on solid ground. There's also pits throughout the Bible that aren't quite as literal, but as difficult and maybe as depressing. David spent years running for his life, evading King Saul. Moses spent 40 years in exile. And Ruth spent years in the pit of poverty. Each and every one of these people, as we read the stories of these heroes and heroines in the Bible, we see that God reached in and pulled them out of that pit. Put them on solid ground. And then ended up using them. David knows this truth. David is praising God that he takes people out of their pits. And it's my prayer and has been my prayer in preparation that that each person that hears this would know that truth deep down. Not on the surface, not be able to repeat it, but truly know in your heart that whether you're in a pit now or find yourself in a pit in the future, that God will be there for you. That God wants to pull you out of those pits. We know that as we walk with God, that he will lead us. He will restore us and protect us. We know that he'll meet our physical needs here on this earth. For for those of us who know Jesus, we know that. But the truth is, just like David, we know that's not enough. In Mark 8, 36, we read, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Because here's the reality. Unless our sins are forgiven, we'll never know the blessing of living eternally with God. That this is where it all starts. This is the biggest and deepest and worst pit we can possibly find ourselves in. And it's the pit of separation from God. For those of you who have a relationship with God through Jesus, you've already been pulled out of this pit. And for some of you, you're still in that pit, still separated from God because you haven't yet taken the opportunity to receive Jesus as your Savior. This is something that you can do at any time. By simply acknowledging that you're a sinner, that you're separate from God, that you're powerless, that you understand that God loved us so much that he sent his son so that we can have a renewed and reconciled relationship with our Heavenly Father. Admit it, acknowledge it, and accept it. That's it. God reaches into that pit, separation, and pulls you out. If you haven't yet done that, I I strongly encourage you. Speak to someone who has. Go talk to another Christian. Go by the Connection Center. Come see one of our prayer people up front after the service. But, But the biggest pit to get out of is that one. And God is ready to pull you out. All you need to do is reach up your hand. And that's really where it starts. It says, continuing in verses 10 through 12 of Psalm 103, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him as far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. If you haven't heard this before, east and west is used because you can go west forever 
You can go east forever. If you continue east, you'll be going east. You can go around the earth hundreds of times and you'll still be going east. Now, if he used north and south, well, you could only go about halfway and then you'd be going the other direction, which means there'd be an end to God's willingness to forgive. But there isn't. God separates us from all of our sins when we accept Jesus as our Savior. When he forgives us, he will remember our sins no more. And that's the starting point because this is the God that we serve. A God who loves us so much that he's not only willing to meet our daily physical needs, but that loves us so much that he gave his son to die for our sins so that we may have eternal life. I truly believe if we start there with our gratitude, we start there with our thankfulness, the rest the rest takes on a whole different look. I think that when we are able to recognize the spiritual blessings in our life, the other blessings, the health, the home, the, the possessions, the family and the friends, it's like gravy on mashed potatoes. It's like sprinkles on the icing on the cupcake. Like Those things are just to top it off. If we truly know deep down what God has done and how he's pulled us up out of the pit, those other things take on a different meaning. You can go on throughout Psalm 103 and, and read about different ways people get into pits. And we know even from just the few that I talked about that often people end up in pits because somebody else put them there. It also says that some ended up in pits because of their rebellious ways. I found myself in pits because of that. I found myself in pits because of my poor decisions and because of my lifestyle. That's not going to be everybody's story and everybody isn't going to find themselves that way. Sometimes we find ourselves in pits because of our circumstances beyond our control. But however you got into the pit you're in, however you got into those pits you've been in, God can pull you out. God can pull you out. I was able to identify three kind of distinct pits that I found myself in. One is the pit of drug and alcohol addiction. Solely by my own decisions, my own choices, that I find myself in a pit that I could not climb out of. My friends and my family tried pulling me out, and they couldn't either. God pulled me out of that pit. It's been 22 years since I've been pulled out of that pit, and I'm now able to live a, a clean and sober life. I found myself in a pit of financial disaster. Again, due to my own choices and my own spending habits, I found myself up to here in debt and unable to pull myself out. God pulled me out of that as well. I found myself in a pit of estrangement from my family because of the lifestyle I was living because of the decisions I was making. The people closest to me were, were unable to trust me because of how I was living. And that's hard. It's hard to be in that place and have no control and no way to get out. God pulled me out of that pit as well. And I now have a wonderful relationship with my family and have rebuilt some great friendships. Now my family still annoys me from time to time. But at least they're talking to me. At least, at least they're part of my kid's life. It's because God pulled me out of that pit. Well, all three of those pits I was in quite a long time ago. 
And so what I see, see seems to happen in my life is that because it was so long ago, the memory of being in those pits fades a bit. I get to a place where I don't heed what David said and forget not all his benefits. I kind of forget about those. I kind of lose sight of the fact that God's done a lot in my life. Now, I do think it's important to focus on the here and now and the things that God is doing in our life every day because our testimonies are being built every day as God works in and through our lives. But we can't forget what he's done for us in the past, especially as we're going through a struggle now where we find ourselves in a pit in the future. We need to stop and we need to thank God for what he's done and how he has pulled us out of pits. Because when we do that, I think it helps us as we look forward. I did a quick search of the internet and looked up benefits of thankfulness, reasons to be grateful, and I found websites, lots and lots and lots of them. The first one I pulled up said, five scientifically proven reasons that gratitude matters. I was like, five? There's got to be more than that. I scrolled down some more. Seven scientifically proven reasons that thankfulness matters. I got all the way up to 31 reasons that we should be grateful. The truth is, being thankful, living a grateful life, having an appreciative heart, helps us in life. Like, it it is a reality. We should be able to read the Bible and read 1 Thessalonians 5.18, be thankful in all circumstances and say, oh, God said be thankful, so let's do it. Well, just as a parent tells his children what to do because there's a reason behind it, God, the most loving father of all, does the same thing. He tells us to be thankful because it's a good thing for us. He tells us to be grateful because our lives will be better. A few of the things that I saw across all of the websites were that grateful people are more hopeful and they're healthier. And that people who are thankful have improved mental health and physical health. Grateful people even sleep better at night. Well, there's three out of 31. You can go research the others. The bottom line is, God wants us to be thankful because it's a good thing for us. And if we start at being thankful for the most fundamental foundational things, and that's God's love for us, his compassion on us, and the fact that he has already pulled those of us who know Jesus up out of the biggest pit ever, it makes those other things much easier to deal with. Now, I gotta tell you, my life is not all together. I'm going to tell you that today I'm not without struggles. I have two major issues that I'm dealing with with two of my children right now. It's a constant battle. One is in the home and one is in the school. And, and the fact of the matter is I could get focused on what these issues are. But I'm not going to. I'm going to still do my work. I'm going to put in effort. But the reality is, I'm going to be thankful that I have these children, that I get to be a dad, and that I get to go through these things. In your bulletin, there's always some Bible reading, and there's always a memorize, reflect, a prayer direction, and a live it challenge. I want to encourage you to do that this week. The live it challenge I called Flip the Script. The bottom line is when you're going through a difficult situation in your life, when you're in a circumstance that's hard, flip it over and look at the blessings in your life. Specifically there, I listed one that might be hard for you to do, but I, I challenge you to try it. You're driving down the road and you get a flat tire. Instead of being upset and frustrated and angry that you've got a flat tire, thank God that you have a car to drive that was able to get a flat tire. Uh, I've gotten bills that I didn't want to get that emptied out what was in my checking account. 
And I've found myself over time complaining or being frustrated about the bills. I've started shifting it. And when I have the money, thanking God that I had the money to pay that bill. When we do that, it just changes everything about our lives. I want to challenge you to start this week. Flip the script. Look at the blessings in your life and just see what God will do. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the blessings in our lives. I thank you for pulling me out of so many pits. Lord, I know that uh, I couldn't get out of them on my own. I pray that we would all have this realization that you continue to pull us out of pits. May we be focused on the blessings in our life and forget not your benefits. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.